What is up everybody? We're going to be jumping into the mentorship portion of the Smart Rider Principles, teaching and mentoring other motorcycle riders. Now, if you don't have anybody to mentor, this is actually good information for maybe how you learn. Uh, think about going to a class, think about going anywhere and taking an online course like this and uh, understanding, you know, this is kind of how I learn better, that I don't learn this way, and we're going to be focusing on stuff like that. So it can help you actually learn a little bit better. This, these are things that I've done, and these are things that I have uh, experienced, and I realize, you know, I work really well with kind of just watching other people and then acting on my own, more of a one-on-one. -on -one. We'll talk about that. So introduction, though, to adult learning principles, because this is a big thing here, okay? So Smart Rider Principles, it gets you into that mindset of, hey, this is kind of like the direction we should be going. We always uh, fall back to those principles. Same thing here. So if you don't know anything about this, great. It's going to be a, it's a nice little learning lesson for you. So we differ significantly from younger learners because um, we don't have a lot of time, really. I mean, as a kid, you're going to school. You're constantly, like, bombarded with, like, math, science, like, all these, like, super basic fundamental stuff that build into other things. As adults, it's like, well, how does math help me when it comes to riding a motorcycle? Or how does math help me when it comes to changing my oil? Well, it, it kind of kind of does help you, um, but we're not learning that. So we have to have this motivation to do this. And also, you know, we need to make sure that it actually suits us. You know, online courses, in-person, one-on-one group, um, all these different things. It's, it's all important to understand what you do and how you learn better. Uh, it's not just about imparting knowledge, but understanding how audiences learn. So think about yourself. How do you learn? Okay. So characteristics of adult learners, we're going to power through some of these things. So life experience. So if you're brand new and you have no life experience, um, it's pretty easy because you're like a sponge. But if you do have some previous life experiences, uh, you can hinder or it can help you if your previous life experience um, kind of sets you in, in place and it's like you're not going to change that can be a problem But if you're open to new possibilities because you knew from previous life experiences that if you just you know Have that beginner's mind you're able to learn new things. You can actually learn a lot quicker Self-direction um, so a lot of people like to learn the stuff like me I like to just you know read it and then it's like let me kind of go on my own little path And when I have questions, I'm going to ask those questions. So having uh, goals and benchmarks are really important because if you don't really have that, you're not really shooting for something. You're just kind of learning random stuff and it can get confusing. Okay. So having goals, like I said, really important for me uh, right now during my life right now, I, my goal is to get into better physical shape. So what I did was actually signed up for the Spartan trifecta weekend. So it's like a half marathon, eight, nine miler, and then like a 5k type thing um, all in one weekend. And I'm not trained for it. I, I'm in some decent shape, but I set that goal out there. I got a couple months, and I'm, I'm now going from that end up to now and practicing and training and training and training so I can get a little bit better. I'm going to walk it. I'm not going to hurt myself. Uh, for relevance, this is really important. So it's like, you know, what am I doing here, right? Like, what am I doing here? Like, wh wh why am I, you know, using my time? I think as adults, we understand time is very valuable, and even more so, our focus is very valuable. And right there, so time and uh, resource constraints, you know, juggling work, family, education can be challenging, uh, affecting their commitment and focus. So if like you're thinking about, you know, hey, my kid is sick, I can't really focus on work, I can't focus on learning something new, I don't have the time and space for it, it can get very difficult. We're going to try to power through some of these things. We still got, we got like 40 something slides here, but it's all good information. Once again, we're going to, we're going to really focus on this. So andragogy, that's. Um, something that, that adults tend to do. So pedagogy is going to be more so of what we've done in, in the past, where we have a teacher and it's like, listen to me, here's the information, learn it. Uh, andragogy is going to be more so, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, peer uh, mentorship, everything that we're trying to do here at the Smart Rider uh, Principles and the MTC Rider Academy is that if once you learn something, you make connections to somebody else that knows something, make something or connection to somebody else, to somebody else, somebody else, but then everyone still communicates and you learn a little bit here, learn a little bit here, learn a little bit here. And it's really important because that's uh, how a lot of adults learn is through connections, through work, through meetings, you know, well, some meetings, um, one-on-ones, you know, with getting good feedback. So it's really important um, that we understand the adult learning theory of this. So self-directed learning, uh, relevance and application. So like if you're at work and you're going through a meeting, you don't want to hear about, you know, how to cook. You're, it's like, let's figure out what we're doing here at work. Um, but you can use uh, analogies of cooking to kind of get you in there. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Motivation. Um, we want to make sure that we have our personal goals and life experiences uh, aligned with what we're trying to learn. Like I said, if you don't care to cook or, or if you don't care to like learn 
um, how to drive a, a semi truck, then what are we doing here, right? And you're not gonna you're not gonna care. So experiential learning. So we're gonna be jumping into different kinds of of how do we learn at the beginning of these slides. Um, we're gonna get into frameworks. We're gonna get into active listening. We're gonna get into all that stuff. So right now we're kind of just focusing on some of the uh, the main objectives here. So active participation. Um, this is a big one. So. Uh, as kids, we, we kind of sat there and listened, but we do like to play. So PE class, you know, recess is very important because that's actually a learning experience is play. As adults, it's almost like combined. So as kids, it's like sectioned. You're like, you know, we're, we're playing, we're learning, we're playing, we're learning. As adults, it actually really comes into play, or comes into play, comes into a situation where it's like, let's do it all together. Okay, so hands-on, kinesthology type stuff where you're actually touching and grabbing the sensation while also thinking at the same time. As adults, we can do that. So it's very important that we actually participate. So if you're out there in a class and it's like, I don't want to participate, I just want to watch, you're only going to get half of that information because at the end of the day, you still have to do some active, some actual touching and some actual um, uh, participation. So think about that next time you don't want to participate. Just participate. It, it sucks. It, a little risky in your mind. You know, it's a feeling that you're having, but you know, just get in there and do it. Okay. A real world application, reflection, feedback loop. So, we're actually going out there and making scenarios. That's why we do the after action reviews on Dana the Fireman YouTube channel. Uh, we want to figure out what you know. Why is this important? Um, and we do an after action review of it. We reflect on it. Um, so it's like, okay, now I understand. I have to ask my own questions. And then the feedback loop is where it's like, hey, I got a question answer, it comes back, it's like, okay, validation, very important. So learning by doing is very important, so it's, it's a participation type thing when it comes to that. So deep personal change, so it's like, for me, when it comes to learning, it's like, how does this apply to my life? Um, I didn't like how I did something in the past, you know, with the information I had, I made mistakes, but now I know better. Um, so it's like, okay, I have to make that change. And that's how, you know, if you ever have to uh, forgive somebody or ask for forgiveness. It's not just about saying the words, it's actually about changing. And think about your own mistakes in the past. It's like, you know, I forgive myself from the past, how do I make that change? So the only way you can really do that is, is come in with that beginner's mind and trying to learn. So when you challenge your assumption of, you know what, did I do the right thing? And sometimes you don't want to, you know, gaslight yourself. You don't want to get into that position of like, I don't think I'm, you know, you know good, don't self-shame, don't do guilt. But it's like, okay, with the information I had back then, I made a mistake with information I have now, I feel guilty about it, but how do I go in the future to change that? So changing your perspective is really important with that. Sometimes we think, you know, we're the best or we're good at this and then we're challenged with something and it's like, okay, maybe not. Let's just maintain that beginner's mind. Reflective discourse. So actually having these discussions, you know, getting that validation, talking to a friend, it's like, hey, you know, this is what I did in the past, this is what I'm thinking now. It's like, does this sound like about right? Especially with friends that actually have grown into that that arena of like reflection and, and learning so this is where it's really good to have a mentor or somebody that's you know for motorcycling specifically it's like hey i made this mistake with braking you know this is what i'm thinking i should be doing differently what do you think and if they're an instructor or a mentor or somebody with more experience we're like that's great continue doing that i'm glad you thought of that i'm glad you're you're learning i'm proud of you and we'll talk more about empathy action take make sure you do it don't just just don't don't go through the process of figuring things out and just not doing anything actually make those changes, active, physical changes, okay? So teaching adults, okay? This is that first section right here, okay? Slide six, we got, you know, slide 45, you know, we're, we're powering through. Um, so teaching adults requires an understanding of the unique characteristics and learning preferences. Tailoring your approach based on learning theories can enhance engagement and knowledge retention. So if you actually know how to teach, or I'm sorry, if you know how to learn, it's easier to teach, okay? So if you're in the process right now, I just, you know, I wanna learn how to learn. Don't worry about teaching anybody yet, um, it, it, but if you want to, if you want to apply that, think about teaching yourself, okay? Self-directed, right? Um, the way I like to do that is I like to think of myself um, as two different individuals. Right now, actually three, but two individuals of, I got a little inner child here, you know, a little eight-year-old Daniel, and then I got a 16-year-old Daniel, a little teenager, but uh, how would I teach an eight-year-old? How would I teach my teenager? As an adult, I'm teaching. So that's how I do it, um, and it allows me to teach and allows me to learn, because I like to teach myself a little bit of empathy here. So the goal isn't just knowledge transfer, but enabling learners to apply, reflect, and grow. 
very important. Okay, so we're gonna get into this one right here. So uh, we're gonna uh, make sure that we are being effective, all right? So recognize the distinctive characteristics and preferences of adult learners, key strategies, relevance, active learning, supportive environment, the significance of motivation and engagement in adult education. So uh, supportive environment's a big one. We, we talk, we're gonna talk about empathy, um, but we're gonna first talk about relevance, okay? Let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Real life connection. So this is one of those things, if you see right here with the after action reviews, is that's a real life connection to what we're trying to do here. So this was actually like a, a, a new writer. He commented on the Instagram uh, when I posted it. Um, a new writer going around a corner, went super wide, put his feet down, hit the, the leaves on the edge of the road, and then dumped the bike. And so this was a great example of, hey, we should be practicing our tight turns from a stop out in a parking lot. You know, head turn, handlebar turn, friction zone, throttle control. Here, it was just, it, it was a mistake. And so providing relevance of, okay, well, this is why we practice this, right? This is why we wear gear, right? So real life connection, um, we wanna make sure that we have those scenarios out there for people. Um, for those that uh, are, are like, you know, I don't need to learn how to do tight turns. Uh, you know, I'm good enough. Or, you know, my buddy did this, or I actually did this. It's like, how do I fix this? We make sure we align with the goals, okay? So we have to make sure that what we're showing, what we're doing, is actually applying to the individual themselves. You don't wanna be showing them how to do, you know, knee down on, at the track when they're a brand new rider. It's not relevant to them and their goals right there. So what's relevant, let's focus on that. So we're gonna encourage active learning. So group discussions are great. Um, how do we do that, especially when we're by ourselves? A little bit difficult. Um, this is why we, uh, on the Discord server that we have is that we have a lot of people talking. Um, we make sure during uh, the live streams that people are communicating in the chat room. Uh, those are all really important. So in order to make it more dynamic and interactive, we use case studies, like I said, with the after action reviews, is that we're actually dissecting real uh, scenarios. And then uh, applying theoretical knowledge, yes, we can do that. That's motorcycle training concepts. We're having motorcycle training and the ideas of things. But at the same time, we do have some real world stuff and we actually, you know, progressive braking, you know, making sure we're doing slow press and roll, um, and then utilizing the MTC awareness stages and the plan method. Problem solving activities is where you throw it right back onto the individual. It's like, so what would you do? You know, how would we handle this? What is one factor? You start throwing questions out, not necessarily as a quiz, but more so as, hey, let's go ahead and get some critical thinking. Let's not just listen to me or the instructor. So if I'm talking to my eight year old myself or my 16 year old self, it's like, okay, so what would you do with your eight-year-old knowledge? What would you do with your 16-year-old knowledge? How would you handle this situation? And I'm able to kind of go through the process and be like, okay, that's great. That's how you would handle it. This is how I'd handle it. Let's go ahead and combine the two and, and do better, okay? Oh, there we go. Nope, one more. Supportive learning environment. So peer learning. Um, so this is really cool because it, it, with peers, you know, side, side by side, let's, I'm 36, maybe another 36-year-old whatever it is, you know, somebody close, um, as an age peer, right? I'm able to communicate and we have different life experiences, but we also have 36 years on this, on this rock <laughs> called earth. But peers can also be, I'm 36, but then there's a 20 year old that has been riding for a while, learned something new, a bunch of different stuff when it comes to riding motorcycles. And we're able to align and communicate on things. And we're actually peers when it comes to motorcycle riding, just not peers in life experiences. So I might have more experience with the relationships than that 20 year old, but that 20 year old has new information that came out um, that I haven't heard yet when it comes to motorcycling. We're able to teach each other, me from experience, them from the book. Um, and even if they do have experience riding you know, for 15 years, you know, in place of their whole life, I now can uh, understand and learn from who taught them for 15 years, which is probably like a family member. Uh, so very good. Uh, making sure you can learn from actual peers is really important because it allows you to not necessarily sit there with an authority figure thinking that you know you have to pay attention, you have to be uh, listening to them and you know you can't question it. Peers are a little bit easier to, to question each other and have that feedback, right? So you're able to talk to each other, able to understand, hey, you know, this is what I've learned, that's what you learned, great, we're both right or we're both wrong or you're wrong, I'm right, it doesn't really matter though, we're learning from each other, this is great. Um, you know, how do we figure this out? How do we solve this problem of, of breaking in an emergency? Like how did you solve it? This is how I solved it. And that's the, the beauty of having a peer relationship with something like that. And it's like, think of it as like a friendship and acquaintance. Uh, recognition, it's really good to start saying empathetic things, and we'll talk more about that, but it's more of like, hey, I'm proud of you for, for handling that situation you did. Must have been very difficult. Sometimes people just need to have those affirmations, okay? 
So nurturing your environment transform every hurdle into a learning opportunity. We're going to have some quotes here on the side because I think they're very important when it comes to stuff like this. Okay, so motivation, engagement in adult learning. Uh, so personal, professional goals, making sure that we all understand, hey, where we're coming from, where we're going. We talked about those goals, okay? So engagement strategies, making sure that we can actually, you know, talk to each other. So if we're all online, how do we do that? Chat rooms, um, Discord server. Uh, we have the discussion uh, here at the MTC Rider Academy. I think it's on the top right of your screen. You click the little chat bubble. You can actually have discussions here. Uh, supportive learning spaces. Right now we're all kind of remote, but uh, if you're ever going to be out there, you know, learning something, the, the environment itself, the classroom itself is, is really important. How it's set up. Uh, can people see the board? Can, you know, is there, is there room for actually collaboration? Is it all cubicles? You can't talk to each other, you know, things like that. So actually setting it up. One thing I like to do, um, or I did like to do, was uh, having a tabletop. So having, you know, dinner. You know, we're all in a circle. We can all have communication. It's very easy and open versus, you know, yelling at each other across the house and trying to figure things out. So it's a great learning environment when you're at the table uh, eating some food. So conclusion of this one. So we're talking, we got three more uh, sections, but we're trying to power through this. Uh, so recognize and respect the uniqueness of each adult learner. So everyone has experiences. Doesn't matter um, if they're good or bad. Uh, they're different and unique, and you can learn from that. So ensure learning remains active, relevant, and in a nurturing space. So good thing that, you know, that's what food, you know, dinner, lunch, you know, th whatever it is. A lot of people are able to uh, communicate well, especially in you know a setting of of eat, shared eating, shared nutrients, shared um, basically just you know trying to survive. <laughs> Continual adaptation, feedback, and collaboration are keys to transformative adult education. To teach adults effectively, one must walk beside them in their learning journey, not in front. You're not trying to direct them where they're going. You're you're trying to learn where they're going. And when you're learning where they're going, guess what you're learning. So you're absolutely learning. So mastering effective communication and teaching. So this is really important because we actually have to be able to communicate with people. So for me, communicating to you, I'm learning how to communicate to you. So after this course, I'm redoing it and I'm going to get better and better and better because I'm always actively learning with your guys' feedback. So bridging the gap between knowledge and comprehension, building trust and fostering an engagement, enhancing the overall learning experience. Teaching is not just about transferring knowledge. It's about making it resonate. So I can just share so much with you, but it's like, I don't get it, then I failed as a teacher. I want you to be able to understand it. So we're going to be talking about effective communication here. So establishing a learning environment. So we talked briefly about that, having it to where you can actually see, you can actually you know, see the board, hear the information, all that stuff. But this is now more so when it comes to the uh, student, teacher, mentor, mentee, peer-to-peer. -peer. It's like, how do you communicate to foster that learning environment. Because you could just talk at somebody, but we're trying to talk with people. We're trying to listen with people. So building rapport, small talk. Small talk is small talk. You know, just you know, get breaking the ice. Once you hear like that one little thing, um, whether it's interesting or not, but you hear from them a little bit of an inflection, or inflection in their voice, you hear that they are excited about it, that's when you start asking a little bit more questions and start building that trust. Um, because you sound interested, you are interested, whatever it is, to, to hear that. So if somebody's like, yeah, you know, how's your day today? It's like, it was good. You know, I, I, I spent some time first thing in the morning, went walking my dog, had a great time doing that. You know, we do about two, three miles. And then I went to work. It, what did they spend most of their time on? About the dog. Hey, so what's your dog's name? You start building that. It's like, oh, my dog's, my dog's name is Stella. Uh, you know, I got her, you know, nine and a half years ago. Uh, she was a rescue. You see how they just, for me, this is my situation, but it's like, you see how they keep going. So like you can keep asking questions and then you can maybe interject, hey, I have a dog too. I absolutely love walking dogs. And then they can start asking questions. So that's how you build a rapport, mutual respect. And then from there, it's like, okay, cool. I have an understanding that you're, it's a safe environment. Um, you'll listen to me. I listen to you. We have something in common. What are we learning here? And that's kind of where we go with that. So active listening. Giving them your undivided attention. We're going to talk about how to do that a little bit later. Emotional connection. Same thing, exactly what I was talking about here, okay? With the doggos. Okay, so open-ended questions. Spark curiosity and encourage dialogue. And this is verbal communication, okay? We're going to talk about nonverbal pretty soon, too, but verbal is what is how I learn the best. I mean, I can learn from, from nonverbal and everything like that, but, man, if you could just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I can learn quicker. Um, so open-ended questions. That's not closed-ended questions. Like, do you like ice cream? Yes or no? That's a closed-ended question. So open-ended questions are really good, especially for rescue, too, because you want them to speak. 
Okay, you want them to, to express what's going on in their, their mind. They can, they can tell you how they're feeling with their body. Uh, so opening questions are really important. So it's like, you know, how, what, what do you like to do when you're walking uh, your dog? It's kind of open, right? It's not, you can't say yes or no to that. They're able to, uh, to answer that question. Um, yeah, and you get better and better at that as you go. Prompt cards are really good to have too. So anyway, summarizing and paraphrasing. So when it comes to that, it's like, oh, I like to walk my dog, um, you know, about two, three miles a day, um, first thing in the morning, you know, get her to go to the bathroom. Uh, this way I can, you know, you know, listen to an audio book and I get my, my little, my cardio in. It's a lot of fun. And so those summarizing paraphrasing, it's like, oh, that's really cool. So, you know, you get your cardio in. Uh, what kind of book are you listening to? It's really, it's really interesting. So you're able to reinforce that you actually paid attention. Okay. And, but then you're also asking that open-ended question at the same time. Conversational skills are really important. Avoiding, uh, avoiding jargon. It's like, yeah, I'm making sure I, you know, get my cardiovascular, uh, you know, system uh, going, you know, musculoskeletal, you know, making sure my bones don't get osteoporosis. You start using jargon, you know, medical jargon. It's like, you know, I just want to build my, my bones. You know, my, my, my joints are feeling kind of weird, so walking has really been helping. It, change it up. Make it to where it's a little bit more simple, not because you're, you're talking down to somebody. Just because you have that knowledge doesn't mean everyone does. And once they start you know, sharing, hey, you know, I'm in the medical field. It's like, oh, cool, me too. So we can talk about musculoskeletal and, and, a, and a bunch of different stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, now you can up-level your relationship. But start off with not using jargon, okay? Nonverbal, very important, body language. So it's a lot easier when you're online. You can just tippity type and, and look around and not really pay attention. You have like five different tabs open. But when you're in person, when you're in person, give them your attention. Don't be closed off. So if I'm talking like this and I'm just like, yeah, you know, so everything's fine. No, I'm facing you. I'm looking at you. I'm looking with, with my eyes at, into your eyes. I'm giving you the, the information that, you know, we're here for. And I'm making sure that I'm talking to you. You have my attention. Very important. So eye contact, body language. Don't stand side by side. Like, actually just like look at them. Make sure you're not like upset like that. Be more of an open stance and you can have a hand in your pocket. You know, that's something that's comfortable for you, but you're smiling, you know, you're actually trying to be involved. So facial expressions, you'd be like, oh, wow, yeah. You know, like actively do it. It takes some energy. It really does, especially if you're an introvert. It does take energy, but it really does deepen the bond. It really does, okay? So clarity and simplicity. This is something that I, I talk a lot. I mean, we're 22 minutes into this and we're, we're halfway through. We might have to cut this up into two parts, but um, I talk a lot uh, because this is a big, a lot of information. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, about frameworks of, and stuff like that, probably in part two. Uh, but clear language. Uh, so we're trying to not use jargon, break it down, use some relatable things. Don't try to overcomplicate things, stick to the actual information. I like to use a little bit of you know, real world analogies to, to emphasize some parts. But in the past, I used to do like six or seven of them per topic, and it was kind of out of, kind of crazy. So I stopped doing that. Conciseness, um, this right here is the big one. So respecting the student's time and cognitive load. So as, <laughs> as much as I want to uh, really bombard you with a lot of information, at the same time, it's like, okay, this is just too much. I need to pause. And if you ever get to that point where the other person needs to pause, um, let them have that pause. Uh, try to shorten it up. You know, if you make a mistake and you speak too much, you speak too long, just the next time uh, do it a little bit less. And that's where practice and repetition. So uh, going on a lot of dates, going, meeting a lot of friends, going to a lot of social events, and, and just realizing there's, there's so many people out there that you can just practice and talk to. <laughs> so really important to be simple when it comes to that. So storytelling and analogies. So this is what I'm talking about here. So storytelling. Uh, we use the after action reviews. I use my little stories about my dog. I use stories about like how my own personal experiences, being authentic to that. Don't make things up because people can under, um, not understand, but they can see through that. So utilizing your life experiences is really important um, in sharing it. And don't make it about you, but more so like this is how what we're learning about right now has affected me in this life experience. Not this is my life experience, therefore it's right. That's not, the information is what we're trying to focus on. Our life experience is, is our opinion. So analogy, same thing. It's really important to utilize uh, more common analogies, more like, hey, that's me type of a feel, or that's so true type of a feel. 
Um, if you're speaking to an audience full of video game people, if you played some video games, talk, use some analogies from, some, from video games. If you're talking to a lot of people that you know, have dogs or um, motorcycles is our thing here, so utilize some analogies when it comes to motorcycles, things that they know too. So engagement, have them share some stuff. Be like, hey, what do you, what do you guys think? Like, you know, what do you, what do you enjoy when it comes to walking your dog? You know, do you like to just watch your dog have a great time and be out there and free? Or do you like to, you know, do some discipline training? Do you like to do some obedience training, stuff like that? What do you like to do? So stuff like that. So let's go ahead and conclude this section. So effective communication is a linchpin of impactful teaching. Prioritize clarity, relatability, and emotional connection. Empower students to realize their potential through resonance. And that's the, the stories and analogies right there. When we truly communicate, we don't just educate, we inspire. So being able to share your story might inspire somebody to, to learn something new. Okay? Okay, we're going to get through this one and we're going to have part two. Okay? So uh, stick with me, guys. Uh, the power of active listening and teaching. This is actually really important. Okay? I mean, all of it's really... All of it's really important, but how are you going to know that your audience or your, your student or your mentee or whoever you're talking to, your peer, likes video games so you can start using analogies for video games? Small talk can lead into this, but the only way you're going to do that is by actively listening. Not sitting there waiting for you to speak, but actively listening. And, and one thing that, that we talked about is paraphrasing and summarizing. Sit there and listen and pay attention so you can summarize and say it back and say, is this what you mean by that? And then you can go on. So we're going to talk about that. It goes beyond merely hearing. It's understanding internalizing that this is somebody with a, their unique perspective and experience. A fundamental skill for transformative teaching, is, it's been one of the best things I've ever done because it, it keeps the, the conversation going. It keeps the rapport going. And it's not about me. You, you've met those people that it's like, as soon as you tell them your story, it's about them. And it kind of shuts you down a little bit. So uh, establish trust and deep connections. Exactly, exactly. Why actively listen in education? So when it comes to building something, so building a relationship, listening, building, um, you know, if you're new on the job and you're having to build your skill set, you have to listen to somebody that has a little bit more experience. So at the end of the day, building something, either your education or relationship, whatever it is, you have to learn about the other thing. In order to learn about the other thing, you don't have this knowledge yet, you have to listen. So building that trust, you know, unlocking the potential through understanding. So anyways, I'm just like saying stuff here. Uh, creates an environment where students feel uh, safe and valued. So if you're listening to your student, they think, hey, I can learn and listen you, to you too. You're showing me that you're listening. I, I like how you listen to me. I want to listen to you. And that's really where it comes into. You have to lead that aspect. Students do show up and go to your class or, or they do show up and, and want to meet you for dinner or lunch or students, like mentors, peers, whatever it is, meet you for dinner or whatever. They want to, doesn't mean they have to. And they want to do it again if they know that, hey, somebody validated me. Somebody listened to me. I feel secure here. I want to do this again because that made me feel good. And that's when, you know, just nat natural learning and natural teaching happens. So you want to personalize their learning experience. And the only way you're going to do that is by learning and listening. Early problem detection. They will tell you their problem. They will tell you what's going on. They will tell you uh, just by talking, conversating. That's why podcasts are really good because uh, it's just conversation. Um, but this way you can actually um, hear what they have to say and start on that versus like waiting till the end. It's like, here's the things we do. Okay. So here's some problems when it comes to active listening. And, you know, ADHD kicks in. I have ADHD. Um, I have some, some other things on the spectrum, I'm, I'm sure, uh, which makes it very difficult for me to pay attention. You know, I, I have hypervigilance from PTSD, so I can hear other people's conversations. I see people walk in through the door. I have to have my back to a wall so I can see the front door. And when some people walk in, my glance just kind of goes real quick, but I have to focus, refocus back uh, on who I'm talking to. Those are some things that get me. But through practice, I've been able to just push them aside because, you know, I'm in a safe environment for the most part. So distractions, that's a big thing. So uh, a lot of people just, you know, like I said, all my, my issues, right, PTSD, ADHD, those are, those are things that I know. But some people just don't care and they'll just be distracted. This is where you have to care. This is where you have to focus in, okay? So preconceived notions. So it's like, oh, I don't need to listen to this person because they're 20 years old and I'm 36. No, 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 no. Don't, 
No, you can you can learn. I've learned from a baby. I've learned from a toddler. I've learned from a little child. I've learned from an elderly person. I've learned from a stranger that I'm just witnessing on the street. I've learned. You will learn from anything and everything. It depends on what you are learning, though. You know, I learned from a little baby and a toddler the meaning of of connection and 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 wanting. Uh, to be near people, and it's like the the most basic needs of any human being you can witness in a baby and a toddler, that's, and that's beautiful. Uh, the more complex needs are more, uh, you know, with experience and uh, elderly, but then they always refer back to their basic needs. So you you learn, anyways. You learn a lot of that stuff. So don't have these preconceived notions about you know I don't need to learn from this person because they have nothing to offer. No, you you can learn so much. You can learn what not to do from things. Okay. In patience, uh, it's like, hey, I want to be able to talk now. No, it's going to mess up your learning or your listening. There's there's times where somebody does talk quite a bit, and this is where you can pause, and be like, so wait one second, what you meant is this what you meant, and then you can you can you can have them pause, and they can re restate, um, and then maybe uh, clarify some things for you. But don't don't stop and be like, yeah, you know what that, that happened to me, and blah, blah, this is my turn to talk. No, let's not let's not do that. Let's not do that. So here we go, overcoming, overcoming, <laughs> overcoming uh, listening barriers. Okay, so mindful presence. So actually, be mindful of it. Like I said, when I had the, I have ADHD and P, or PTSD, and I can hear other people's conver- conversations. I can see people walk through the door. I'm mindful of that. So once I hear somebody else's conversation, it's like no, 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 no. When I see somebody walk through the door, it's like no, focus, eye contact, body language. I'm mindful of it, and it's like okay, what are they saying? What are they saying? What are they saying? And that, that also offers me the opportunity to summarize and, and ask, like, so is this what you meant? Because for me, they don't know, but for me, it's like I got distracted. <laughs> so it, it does showcase, and it, I'm allowed to utilize that skill set to, to actively listen a little bit better. So recognize and set aside biases. Guys, just, just don't. Just You can learn from anybody. I walk up into QT to get an energy drink, and I do very quick small talk. And if they're in a good mood, they'll talk. If not, it's like, here, check you out. Cool. I learned practice, right? But some, I had a great conversation with an Uber driver one time. I don't want to jump into it because it's going to take another 20, 30 minutes, but it's been, it was a life-changing conversation I think of to this day. And it's because, you know, I sat there, I had usually have headphones, but she started the conversation. I continued. I was actively listening. I was practicing this. And it's like, wow, what a genuine, what a wonderful person. Honestly, I think it was an angel. Um, so anyways, uh, practice patience. Allow speakers to fully convey their message without interruptions. Just, just sit back. Be like once, if you need to interrupt because they're just, you know, it's 10 minutes in. I'm, I'm what, 32 minutes into this one. Um, take a pause. You can pause this video or you can say, hey, you know, uh, what did you mean by that? I, I'm sorry, I'm not following on that part. And that will allow it to break the cycle, probably like a little bit of a word salad like I do. <laughs> Active listening ter- uh, techniques. So this is right here is really cool. So paraphrasing. So you can pause. You'd be like, one second. Uh, so what did you, when you said this, did, did, is this what you meant? Because I, I don't understand. A little bit of a paraphrasing. So, rest- so you start to like, okay, so you like to walk your dog first thing in the morning. Like what, so do you like how fast, like what do you walk? Like how fast do you walk or... Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not following. Like, do you go for long walks? Do you like, so you start to do that and then summarizing, it could be more so it's like, cool. So you like to go for long walks about two, three miles a day. Man, that's really great. Um, your dog probably loves it. Um, getting some good cardio in. Is that like how you do your cardio? Like, do you go out for like an evening walk? Do you like to work out? You, you could start, you see how the pair or I'm sorry, the summarizing led into another, com- uh, another question to allow some communication. So really important. So feedback. This is also really cool. This is really this is really good. Some people think of it as criticism, but if you're in a safe environment, it's it's really good feedback. It's it's something that's going to allow you to learn. So highlight exact areas of strength and need and needed improvement. So this is more so it's like somebody's asking you questions. Um, not not a lot of people like um, uh, unsolicited feedback. So be very careful with that. Um, so the best way you can do that when it comes to specific and constructive is like, oh, I think that's really cool that you're going for these walks. Are you, are you wanting to improve your cardio? Have you thought about jogging like with your dog? And then they'll be like, you know, my dog's old, doesn't like to jog. And it's, but that allows them to think, you know, maybe I should, you know, set my, leave my dog at home and go for like a half mile jog too. Because I do want to improve my cardio, but my dog can't do it. 
but you're not telling them that. You're not saying, hey, you should probably leave your dog home so you can go jog if that's the problem. No, no, it's, you, just, you just say it and you leave it, let them think and internalize it. And if they don't and don't process it, it's not like it's your cardio, it's not your, <laughs> it's not your heart. So two-way dialogue, promote an environment where both mentor and student contribute to the feedback process. And so if you, if, if you allowed your, your peer, your student, your mentee to give you feedback, the, one of the really cool ways of, of handling that so that you can uh, showcase and lead them into thinking the same way is that let's, let's flip it on a script where I'm saying as the mentor, um, it's like, yeah, you know, what? I love walking my dog. Um, this is how I get my cardio in. Um, but, you know, I, I've been wanting to jog, but I haven't. And so then the, the student or the mentee um, can, can then say, you know, I love jogging. You know, you, you should definitely go jogging. Maybe leave your dog at home. It's like, you know what, you're right. Maybe I should try that. I think that's great. That's a great idea. That showcases, hey, you're allowed to give that feedback, that constructive feedback. Not criticism, but constructive feedback of like, you know what, your idea was great. So when it comes down to it, it's like when they're saying something that they're doing, it's like, you know, I've been really wanting to ride motorcycles. Or I mean, I'm riding motorcycles, but you know, I'm having some trouble with my, you know, just at, at lights, like stopping. It's been really difficult. So, you know, hey, how about you try going to a parking lot, practice your progressive braking, get up to about 20 miles per hour, squeeze that front brake, you know, think of it like the orange and get some orange juice out and just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And once you get that weight on that front tire, you know, squeeze even more. You're like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I should go practice that. That's a great idea. It's because you showcased earlier that you're open to new ideas. You're open to that dialogue that they're like, okay, cool. You know, if I could do it, he, you know, maybe, you know, so you have this really good rapport. Uh, so collaborative goal setting. So coming up with goals together, you know, it's, uh, it could be anything. Um, you know, it's like, hey, you want to do cardio? I want to do cardio. Where do you live? Where, maybe, sun, maybe Sunday mornings, let's, uh, let's go for a quick hike. It's like, yeah, dude, let's do it. And then you even more, okay? So it's really good. Uh, so conclusion, active listening paves the way for trust, personalized learning, and, and early problem detection, mindful practices, and effective techniques foster clear understanding, feedback, and open communication catalyze growth and success. Active listening is so important, so important. You can teach somebody by just allowing them to talk. So many people, if, if, for men out there, for anybody out there with girlfriends, wives, or whoever, if they're telling you your, their problem, ask them, are you venting or do you want me to come up with solutions? And I'm going to tell you right now, most of the time, if not all the time, they're going to say, I'm just venting. And at the end of it, if you just sat there and shut up, they're going to solve their own problem because that, that's their version of journaling. A lot of people, that's how they journal. That's how they get their, their thoughts into words out in space. They hear it. It's like, you know what? I can solve this problem. I like to write it down. I also like to say it. So there's so many different ways. If you could just listen, they most of the time can solve their own problems. Foster that though, okay? So the role of empathy, here we go. So uh, empathy is very important. So honesty with compassion is, is something that I really love to do. So being not blunt, but being honest with a hint of compassion of where they're coming from. It's very important. So not just understanding, but feeling with others. Okay, it's a little bit difficult. If you don't know how to feel yourself, it's gonna be difficult to feel with, for others. Um, but if you do think of yourself as an empath or somebody with empathy, uh, go ahead and turn that inwards and, and ask yourself that question. It's like, you know, do I understand the feelings I'm currently having? Do I understand the feelings I have? Do I sit with my own feelings? So ask yourself those questions, okay? So a cornerstone of, uh, cornerstone of human connection interaction and transforms teaching from a mere process to a profound relationship. So we're talking about mentorship here. But think back to all those good teachers that you've had in the past. Did they care about you? Probably. Probably. There we go. I was going to make sure I didn't skip, one, skip anyone. There we go. So the role of empathy enhances perception of the learning experience, establishes trust, rapport, and openness, encourages learners' participation and receptiveness to feedback. When students feel seen, they shine. So this is, when we talked about having the environment that is conducive to learning, empathy is a huge thing uh, when it comes to that. So listening to somebody, uh, listening to somebody because of their experiences, and then, sh and then being able to uh, do verbal and nonverbal communication to somebody that it's like makes them feel safe to open, be vulnerable. In order to learn, you have to be vulnerable. And that's why a lot of students, uh, kids nowadays, are having difficulty in classes because it's just they, they don't feel safe. They don't, it's not a learning environment for them. 
So in, in order to, to learn, you have to be vulnerable. In order to do that, you need to have somebody in a leadership position understanding that we need to be vulnerable, so I'm going to make it a safe place for you. Okay, and that's the leadership part. So embracing diversity with empathy, okay? So the diversity, not in terms of probably what you're thinking, not in terms of race, age, gender, none of that stuff. No, no, no. Uh, experiences. Everyone has different experiences. I had a different childhood than most people, but most people have different childhoods than most other people. Everyone has different life leading up to a certain spot. Some people are happy. Some people are sad. Some people have had no relationships. Some people have had too many. Some people are, it doesn't matter. It's not, it has nothing to do with race, gender, uh, ideologies, any of that stuff. It's all combined into that. Um, where are you now? Where are you now? Leading up to it, but yeah, where are you now and where are you going? Okay. So if we can recognize these backgrounds, it'll help out with uh, the teaching. Like I said, somebody's into video games, right? It's a diverse, it's a different thing. Somebody's so into video games, that's how they learn so much. That's how they communicate with their friends. This is how they, so if you're able to communicate in that way to them, you're allowing them to feel safe and secure because it's something they're used to. And that's what I'm talking about here, okay? So an empathetic learning ecosystem, okay? We're setting things up for them. So an environment where every learner feels safe and valued. It's like you showed up to learn. I'm proud of you. I am so proud of you to show up to learn. Not a lot of people want to show up to learn. You're here. You're taking this seriously. Let's learn together. Beautiful. So personalized understanding of individual learners' needs. So just because you have a class of six people or so or whatever it is, whatever you're doing, you know, you have three kids, especially those that are parents. You have three kids. Each one of them is different. Each one of them is different. You have to change it up. You can't just blanket. Like everyone's going to learn through discipline and like we're going to just power through it, routine schedule. Some kids, like I said, learn through play. Some kids learn through reading. Some kids learn through just watching. It's, you have to tailor it to that situation. So emotional pillars, support, encouragement, actionable feedback that is empathetic. Okay, So support them through the process. Encourage them through the process. I'm proud of you. You're doing such a great job. Your hard work is paying off. I know it's difficult, but you're doing a great job, right? So much better than saying, you better get straight A's. So techniques for help, fart, help, fart, help, heartfelt communication, okay? So I'm leaving all this stuff in because this is who I am, okay? Communicate with care and intent. So validation, acknowledge and honor learner emotions. Hey, I know it's very difficult right now. Um, I know on this U-turn, you've done 10 of them and you've only gotten three of them. I know it's discouraging, but guess what? You got three of them. How many did you get yesterday? How many did you get the day before? How many did you get last year? None. Today you got three. That's amazing. For affirmation, recognize strengths, celebrate accomplishments, and inspire progress. I just did that. Did a great job. You're turning your head really good. You didn't do that for the first seven, but you're turning your head really good. Now you're doing that. You have your head, uh, your chin on your shoulder. You're getting good body lean. Let's go and think about it for a little bit on this next one. Let's really turn that head. Let's really turn that head. Let's get number four. So active listening is a tool for deeper understanding. So your, your student, your peer, your friend, whoever it is that you're trying to teach, whoever it is that you're listening to, and, or whatever it is, it's like, so what's going on? Like, tell me what, what you think's happening. And then they say it. Remember when I said if they're just venting, they'll learn? So like, let them speak. It's like, yeah, I just, I'm doing it. I, I, I feel like my, my, my throttle's not that good. Um, like, I, I can't control it. I get too much on the turn. And once that happens, I don't look where I'm going. I look at my hand and it, it turns. They just told you their problem, their throttle control and their head and eye movement. They're not focused. So what do we can do? What, or what do we can do? What can we do? Let's focus on throttle control in this next turn. You know what I mean? Let's not do anything else. Look where you want to go. Sure, do all that stuff. But only focus on your throttle. They'll tell you what the problem is. They'll guide you to what you need to, to teach them or, and, and help them with, with your experiences and knowledge. So, elevating learning through empathy. Guys, hey, you know what? We have 13 more slides. Let's just power through it, right? I didn't, we're not doing part two, okay? So, empathy is more than a skill. It's a teaching philosophy. So, don't just be like, hey, I got a skill of empathy. You know, so I, I won't use this skill. I won't use empathy for this, this right here. No, always have empathy. Always. Make that a part of who you are. And yes, you can, you can teach like somebody It's like very direct, very blunt, but you're not mean. And then you can go over here and you can overemphasize verbal communication and you can have the, you'll have the empathy with it. Over here, you can do nonverbal 
you know, give them the thumbs up or it's like, hey, pay attention, look, you know, whatever it is, but then be like, you're doing good. You could still do a lot of nonverbal. You could still internalize empathy as best you can. And the best way I've done that, how I've, I've really internalized empathy is in showing gratitude for who I am. So go home, whatever it is, you know, right now, pause the video, um, say two things that you're grateful for. Two things. For me right now, what I'm grateful for is my physical health. I am so grateful that I'm still able to do what I, I can do at my, I mean, I'm 36, but still, you know, I've gone through a lot of physical things as a firefighter and, and you know, through a lot of damaging, I had, had skin cancer. It's like, I have my health. I'm so grateful for it. The other thing that I'm grateful for is that I'm in a position where I can actually fulfill uh, my purpose of teaching and coaching. And uh, I have the knowledge and my, my brain still works. You know, some people have traumatic brain injuries from crashes or from getting their head hit from whatever it is, some, any, any kind of trauma. Um, I could have had some disease that could affect my, my learning capabilities. Um, I'm so thankful that I can, I can actively learn and, and participate in, in society this way. I'm so grateful. I really am. Those are just my two things off the top of my head. So here we go. Structured success through teaching and mentoring. So we're going to structure things, okay? So there's, like I said, there's like one-on-one. There's, you know, we're going to go through it. So establish clear roles and responsibilities in the learning journey. So at the end of the day, you know, you, you don't want your, your mentee to be like, oh, I know more than you because you allowed that. It's like you, they, they know more of you in certain areas, but if you're mentoring somebody, you obviously have the experience. And if they feel like they know more, maybe it's time to pass them off onto a new mentor, right? Or maybe get yourself a new mentor. But let's go ahead and uh, establish that. It's like, hey, I'm here to teach you, okay? I'm here to teach you. I'm here to, to help you and guide you through your journey. And at any point you feel like I can't do that for you or you've learned enough from me, then yeah, we can move on. So act as a roadmap for both students and mentors. So what that's happening is, is that it's helping you understand, you know, this is where our end goal is. And at the same time, your student or your mentee understand that's where the end goal is. Like I said, side by side on the journey, not in front. Okay, enhances overall learning outcomes and experiences. Yeah, because you know it's like, hey, we just we just passed the U-turn, dude. Great job. Guess what? You know what's next, right? And you're like, yeah, I know figure eights. It's like exactly. We're gonna jump into figure eights now. So it allows the experiences just to progress and go and go and go in a good way. Okay. So consistency. So this is really important. So how many of you have ever gone on a diet that you only lasted a week, and then three months later you're like, man, I'm not where I want to be. Or you, you're doing the diet for the first week really good, but then only on Fridays for the next three months. And he's like, I'm not where I want to be. How many of you have done a diet for three months and it's like you've been consistent Monday, Wednesday, Friday for those three months? It's like, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm actually doing pretty good. Like I'm better than I was now, or I'm now than I was three months ago. Once if you were on a diet five days a week for three months, how would you be? How once if you were on a diet seven days a week for those three months, where would you be? Consistency is very important. Working out, same thing. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or just once a week? What is it that you're doing? Consistency really helps out. Really helps out, especially with the progress. Gives you motivation. Um, it showcases that things are working. Shows that things aren't working. You can make changes. Okay. So consistency and mentoring also ensures high quality guidance, critical for learner growth and progression. So you got to be there for that for that student. You got to be there for that person that you're you're helping out. Um, if if you guys say hey every Thursday we're going to meet up or every Thursday we're going to have a one hour phone call. You have to show up too, because if you don't show up, because remember you're the leader, if you don't show up, they're not going to show up, and they're going to feel abandoned, and they're going to have issues when it comes to learning a little bit later, okay? And your reputation goes down. So you got to show up, got to show up. Enhancing the learning ambiance. So positive environments, ambiance is a fun word. Safe space. You hear about safe spaces all the time. Like I said, it's been utilized in, in a really weird way to the point where uh, it doesn't allow resilience building. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about safe spaces when it comes to, hey, uh, the goal is to learn, but we got to go out there and fail. We got to go out there and fail. And that's the only way. We're going to go out there and fail. We're going to come back and we're going to figure out what happened. And we're going to go back out there and we're going to fail and come back. We're going to have successes and we're going we're gonna to congratulate each other. We're going to you know, uh, celebrate these successes, but we need to go out there and fail. Like we have to. We got to learn from these failures. So uh, making sure that they can voice their concerns, their opinions, they can ask questions, and it's not like, you know, hey, I failed, you know, because I, I suck. It's more like, no, I failed, so like, what can we do? Like, very blunt. It's like, so how, where, where do we go from here? Yeah, I failed. It was a mistake. You know, how do I fix that? And that's what you want to get to, and the only way you're going to get to that is by encouragement, empathy, active listening, 
all those tools that we're talking about. Stimulated participation by inviting ambiance can foster active uh, engagement, elevating the learning uh, experience. So, positive environment. Um, if it's like very rigid, you know, uncomfortable in the area, uh, you're not going to get anybody that's that's super stimulated. You're not going to get anybody that's like excited to participate. If you have fun activities, um, you can. A lot of people do this. They get candy and they're like, "Hey, you answer the question. Here's a candy." It's just fun. You get movement going. You get a free candy. Get some glucose skin. You get a little bit energized, and you crash after class. But not, not in the motorcycle, but <laughs> sugar, sugar rush. Um, but that allows participation. It might seem cheesy, but everybody loves having a little tootsie roll thrown at them, especially the, the the fruity ones. I like those ones a lot. Anyways, here we go. Oh, go back. So take chances by inviting wrong answers only. I like this. I like this a lot. So you have something on the board. It's like, hey, we're about to do some mercy breaking. Wrong answers only. How do you do it? And you'll have students be like, you slam that front brake. You swerve last second. You only use the rear brake. You jump off the bike. Um, and you, you just invite like completely obnoxious wrong answers, right? And it's like, okay, cool, guys. Now, how do you really do it? And then they're like, okay, so what we do is progressively break. It's like, exactly, exactly. So uh, models of teaching and mentoring. So we're going to talk about the traditional. This is kind of what we're doing here in the course. It's a one-way information flow. You know, lots of information. We're uh, 50 minutes into it. Geez, uh, I got to get this out to you. Just learn it. Uh, write notes, whatever it is. Um, but we have to. We have to get this done before you go out there. And so you can start teaching, you can start mentoring, start doing peer-to-peer, -peer. very important. But this is just one way. So let's go and talk about the other way. Cooperative learning uh, model. So this is where if like we're in a class, there's a group setting, we we're talking about the pedagogy where it's like I'm in the middle and everyone else is kind of learning, we're all kind of discussing things. And this is where having team activities is really important. So it's like, okay, let's go ahead and sit down. If you've ever been to MSF or anything like that, it's like, let's go ahead and draw on the board. We're separating into two groups. You know, hey, we're trying to solve this one problem, but we're in two different groups, two different experiences, two different teams. Really cool. I like doing this, but it's also important to switch it up. You know, sometimes we're doing this. Okay, now let's split up. Now let's go back to this. Let's split up. Let's do this. Let's do one-on-ones. You know, the teacher walks around. It's like, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. It's a very good environment, and this is where we're starting to get into, hey, um, how do you learn best? Do you learn best by me just talking to you? Do you learn best by, you know, splitting up into groups and do peer-to-peer -peer and have the teacher kind of chime in? Or do you have something where it's more like this, where it's student-driven exploration, where um, you actually lead the charge? It's like, I want to learn this. So this, think of this right here as YouTube, right? You're on YouTube. It's like, how do I emergency break? And then, then YouTube pops up some videos so you can learn. So it's actually you driving your exploration. It's not necessarily structured in a way that it's going to get you from point A, B, C, D, like in a, in a way that, you know, builds upon each other. It's you're actively like, I'm interested, I want to learn. And that's why part of the, that's why we're doing here at the MTC Rider Academy is like, I, if you want to learn, I want to make sure it's structured. But if you want to learn inquiry-based, uh, motorcycle training concepts YouTube channel just has stuff. If you want to learn um, about you know real life scenarios, Dan and the Fireman has that. So this MTC Rider Academy is structured based, and we're trying to develop uh, the inquiry base with the technology that we currently have, with the cooperate uh, cooperation, everything, everything. We're, we're I'm working on that. But anyways, uh, this fosters creativity because now you're sitting here. It's like okay, I learned how to progressively break. But they're talking about weight transfer on that front tire, and the front tire needs some traction. Well, what, what, what tires have the best traction? Okay, cool. What tires have the best traction? So you're being creative, and you're having to think, and you're having to, like, okay, so now you know about traction, good tires, progressively braking. You know, okay, what well, brakes are the best? Or what brake, how do brakes work? You start going through that. That's, this is how I learned. I've learned almost everything I possibly can through books and YouTube. <laughs> so if, let, write in the comments. Uh, if you're on, yeah, MTC Ride Academy up on the top right. I think it's over there. There's a little button right in there. Personal touch in learning. So this is where that one-on-one. -on -one. So do you learn best when you have like a tutor? You know, you could be in school. You could do homework. You could do all this other stuff. But it's like I, I still don't get it. But I've had, when I had a tutor, you know, 20 minutes with a tutor was like four hours in, in class. You might be here in the in the one-on-one -on -one guidance type thing, and it allows for deep diving, because you know the first 20 minutes it got you through four hours of 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 what was in class. 
the next, let's say you have the tutor for an hour, so 40 more minutes, it's like, let's go ahead and dive deep into these principles. Let's go, let's figure it out. And that's the beautiful thing about one-on-one, and that's why I like mentorship. I love mentorship. Right now, what I'm doing is more of a, a group mentorship, okay? So one-on-one is be like you teaching your girlfriend, teaching your brother, teaching your sister, teaching your dad, teaching your mom, whatever it is, anything, motorcycles, how to cook, how to draw, what TV shows are, are really good, how to utilize the internet connection for your grandma, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you probably just have to keep doing that. Uh, so respecting pedagogical, pedagogical styles, okay? So framework, okay, framework. So let's talk about framework here. We got five more slides, guys. We're gonna get through it. Recognizing methodologies. Every educator's unique style, understanding this is pivotal for optimal knowledge delivery. So for me, I'm trying to learn them all. I'm trying to learn them all. Uh, for me, what I what works best, what works best is uh, that framework of I'm teaching in front of a bunch of people. So it's more of a, a andragogy where it's uh, it's more more so. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's more so uh, like children ask where I'm speaking, everyone learns. But I do love the uh, the roundabout and the round table of of adult learners. So syncing with the strength. So I'm gonna lean into that strength of me being able to communicate a lot, me me being able to uh, verbalize what's going on in my head and do that verbal communication. I am focusing on, um, with the smiles, active listening, nonverbal uh, communication. But I like to, yeah, dancing the tune of the teacher's rhythm. So I'm like dancing with myself. I'm leading the, the situation. But if you're a student, not necessarily a teacher, understanding how the teacher teaches can actually help you out. Because if it's like, oh, they're really good at speaking, I should probably write some notes. Because a lot of it's going to go over my head. And I typically like having hands-on, but the only hands-on I'm going to have is writing notes. Stuff like that. So learner, though, right? So understanding their preferences. So if you're um, uh, the teacher or the mentor right now, uh, if you dive into their uh, individual inclinations, ensures methods resonate with students. So if you're able to understand what they like, you can actually play with their own rhythm. So you can actually go with their rhythm and, and, and understand their world. And I, I talk about video games and it's like, if you can equate motorcycle riding to you know Call of Duty um, and how to slide cancel and whatnot, um, if you know what I'm talking about, or World of Warcraft and guild building, so for friendships and relationships, um, or teamwork when it comes to PVP, you're able to, you're able to talk like that and you're able to, to help out when it comes to uh, understanding principles. So aligning with their motivations, if you are, if you're talking to somebody and you're trying to help them out when it comes to riding a motorcycle and you've been riding for a while, you already know that, yeah, commuting, mountain riding, uh, riding in a group, um, doing some hooligan stuff, uh, going to the track, like you already know a lot of these things. So the more you understand, the more you experience, the, the more you learn. When it comes to your, your mentee or your, your, the person that you're speaking to, your student, what, whoever it is, and they're like, yeah, I really want to commute to work. It's like, ah. Okay, gotcha. I know how to commute to work. I've done it for a couple years. Okay, cool. So what is it that we, we're going to do? We need to focus on the plan method, MTC awareness stages. We need to focus on intersections, corners. Um, watch out for blind spots. Okay, I already know I got to focus on this, but these are all things that I can help out with this student, with this person. So I'm able to structure that, and that's what the MTC Rider Academy is right now, is I'm aligning with the motivations of those of you that want to commute to work or commute or ride in town whatever it is, but not necessarily stunt riding, not necessarily going to the track, but the typical stuff that most motorcycle riders do. So I'm trying to align with your motivations there. Structured success, integration, seamlessly infuse the chosen model into the prevailing in educational environment. So the educational environment that we have right here is video, um, we have audio, we have uh, visual presentations like we're doing here, we have uh, written so you can read about it, so I'm utilizing uh, the technology into the educational environment. Now, if we're out in front and let's say we're at, let's say a restaurant, I have a PowerPoint, whatever, I have my own little conference area. Well, now we're doing some physical stuff. Now I can have some physical activities. We can do group stuff. Like, so I'm, I'm trying to integrate uh, with what I have. And this is what I have here, okay? So feedback loops, regular check-ins and evaluations ensure the model's continued relevance and effectiveness. This is only gonna work if you guys write the comments on that chat. Um, send me an email, info at motorcycletrainingconcepts.com. Let me know how things are going because if not, um, I'm just going to try to keep improving until things stick. 
So I'm constantly going to learn. I'm not going to just wait for you guys. I'm going to constantly try to do this. So continuous adaptability, refinement and growth. Exactly, right? Data-informed decisions. So you guys helping me when it comes to uh, the feedback. I'm open to it. I'm open to it. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's good. <laughs> but I'm open to it. So quantitative. So that's going to be like just, it just naturally, somehow it's just working. Like you, the, the retention is, is really good. Um, just saying, people saying, hey, I learned a lot. Cool. Qualitative is definitely going to be something that's like, okay, um, hey, I was able to teach somebody or I was able to help somebody because of this, this lesson. You know, slide number 27 really resonated with me. Like, so really like getting into there. Uh, st staying dynamic, the willingness to pivot, adapt, or find based on feedback ensures the mentoring model remains effective. I do this for myself because I'm going to rewatch this. I'm going to learn from this. I'm learning already just speaking to you. Um, I'm going to refine it. So this is uh, the basic smart writer course. Uh, before this was the, uh, had a basic writer course. And so th this is the refinement of that course. And there's gonna be a refinement of this course and then a refinement of that course and that course and that course. This is a living course. I'm constantly gonna be updating it based off feedback um, and new knowledge that I currently uh, develop. So growth is born from constant evolution, which is scary because you're constantly changing. And so when I'm watching this and I'm reading this and, and I'm hearing you guys and it's like, you know what, I, I honestly, like deep down, I don't want anybody to say anything because it hurts my feelings and I'd rather just be saying, this is great. No, no, it's like, yeah, th this is, this to me, I've made mistakes already during this presentation. I'm going to redo things. I'm going to make it better. Okay. So tailoring for the impact. So valuing soft skills. Guys, we've got two more slides. Uh, this is the second to last one. Valuing soft skills. So effective mentoring seamlessly integrates communication, active listening, and empathy. Those are soft skills. The hard skills are all the things that you've learned up to this point. How to actually break, how to actually swerve, um, how to utilize the plan method, how, how to pick gear, the writing scenarios, the rescue awareness. Those are all the things that, that you, you learn so that you can actually become better with these. They're called hard skills. Soft skills is going to be the empathy, the honesty, the, the active listening, the people-to-people -people skills, so important, okay? So important, because if not, it would just all be reading blogs, and then you have to learn that way. How do you guys like that? So focus framework, so structured guidance ensures both mentor and mentee drive, derive maximum benefit from their interactions. To truly teach is to touch a life forever. That's important because then they continue to teach because now their new experiences in the same 10 years, they learned from this course, they learned from you or whatever it was, now they're able to share that knowledge and that experience too. So 36 years of experience to this point for me, there was moments in time where I've learned something that I didn't think I was going to be able to share with somebody else because I didn't truly internalize it, but I have. And now you guys get to see that. But back then I had no idea, no idea. So those teachers actually had a huge life uh, changing thing for me. But making sure that you have that structured guidance, really important. Making sure that everyone understands, hey, we're here to learn. Okay. All right. So conclusion, everybody. This is the last slide. Don't worry about it. Uh, cultivating rich environments. So making sure that we actually have an environment that is empathetic, is meant for learning. It's safe, that the relationship is being built. There's rapport being built because you're actively listening. Um, friendships could happen from this. If you're already friends and family, that's great. But uh, if you're strangers, friendships can happen. Uh, flexibility in models. So if you have to change things up, change things up. Some students, you might go into it thinking, you know what, we have to have good conversations before we can actually dive into to the curriculum. Um, and you realize how, like, you know, the first couple sentences, like, okay, this person probably will open up and, and uh, have more to talk about or, or want to be a part of this a little bit more if uh, we show some successes. Um, so let's find out where they're starting. Let's go ahead and make some, some easy stuff or warm-ups and build out some successes for them so then they can feel more excited and feel more at ease in this situation. So you constantly change it up, constantly change it up. Some people with confidence, some people with no confidence, some people nervous, not nervous, whatever it is. You can't just come in saying, hey, I'm going to be purely empathetic. We're going to spend 20, 30 minutes talking, and then we're going to get out there. Some people just be like, let's get out there and do it, and then we'll talk 20, 30 minutes. Okay, so change it up. Structure doesn't confine. It empowers. It gives you the skill set to change things and go. Okay, guys, with that said, um, hopefully you learned quite a bit from this. It was a nice little hour-long power presentation. Um, enjoy it. I hope you guys learned everything you can from the basic smart writer course. Make sure you re -go, or re -go, redo uh, everything because we will be making updates to the whole course uh, with new stuff, new information, solidifying it, making it a little bit easier with your feedback. But with that said, I hope you guys ride safe, be safe, and uh, hopefully I don't see you guys crashing on the road. Don't do that. All right. I'll see you guys later.